was important for me to organize a trip to the Domitilla catacomb because here, 50 years ago, the pact of the catacombs was signed. It's not a dusty document lying in the back of some file in the Vatican, but something that people took that day when they left and lived it out. That pact and that promise to get back to the simplicity of the Gospels, that flame was lit to rediscover the simplicity and the radicalness of that message of the kingdom of God being at hand. Archbishop Romero was neither a Marxist revolutionary nor a naive bishop. His inspiration was the gospel of Jesus Christ, Catholic social teaching, and the commitment expressed by the Catholic bishops of Latin America to the option for the poor. The Catacomb Pact. It's a clear vision, a clear mission for a church serving those that need our services most, the poor and marginalized. In simple terms, to be close to those in need and to put the last first. Council. A number of bishops led by Helda Camara, the Bishop of Recife, had a mass in the catacombs of San Dormitilia. After thinking of all the stuff that went on in the Vatican Council, they made a pact which outlined their way of life, mainly that they would try to take on a life that was in solidarity with the poor, that they would associate their wealth, their way of life, how they would dress, how they would be addressed to reflect a life that was in solidarity with the poor. And they issued a document that reflected what their pact was about. We bishops assembled in the second Vatican, motivated by one another, all on the grace and strength of our Lord Jesus Christ. To avoid everything that may appear as a concession of privilege. We renounce forever the appearance and the substance of wealth. We will not possess in our own names any properties or other goods. We will try to live according to the ordinary manner of our people. The Second Vatican Council changed leaders and inspired these leaders as bishops worldwide, particularly South America and Eastern Bloc countries, to be a different church. In this context, 40 bishops met and more than 500 people later on signed the Catacomb Pact. Looking at the Pact of the Catacombs is also helpful to re revitalize the spirit of the Vatican too, because that is uh, something that we have, uh, what was done in the spirit in the context of the Vatican too. It has much to tell and to, to say to us today. John the 23rd saw the council as a gathering of bishops who came from a church that was stuffy and too closed in, and he wanted the windows and the doors opened and a church to be open to the people, with the people, for the people, and as the people, especially the poor. One of the issues to be discussed at Vatican II was the issue of poverty. Most of the bishops that were coming there were coming from parts of the world where poverty was a real issue. You have the idea of reflecting on the gospel, the way of life that Jesus took to be on the margins, along with the church in the modern world and the issues of the people of God. This spurred them to culminate their celebration at the end of the council and making a clear declaration of how they were going to move forward. I guess now we are going to visit the most extensive catacomb we know around the city of Rome. More than 60 catacombs have been discovered up to now around the ancient city. Thanks to recent studies, we know 
This was one of the biggest ones with more than 11 miles of tunnels. Let's go in. Where the Catagon is today was the private property of the aristocratic woman Flavia Domitilla, the granddaughter of the Roman Emperor Vespasian. In the year 96, Domitilla had converted to Christianity. Because of a Christian faith, she was executed and died as a martyr. She left this huge property to a small group of slaves she had made free, leaving them the right to a private individual grave. This inscription is in an ancient church, inserted at the end of the 4th century AD into the second floor of our catechism. It was providential that uh, our congregation is now in charge of the catacombs, Domitila. We have been there, I think, for five, six years. And when we took charge of the catacombs, the team that was there, they started to publicize the pact. And this was new, even for us, we didn't know it. And it has been our mission since then to make the pact known to the visitors, to the catacombs, and, and to the congregation. I'm Father Franz Helm, Divine Word Missionary from Austria. I like very much the idea that the church isn't the bishops, isn't the pope. The church are the people who try to live what Jesus lived. And he put the poor in the center of his life. For me, the fact of the catacombs shows how all the church could be reborn by putting the people in need, the people who are uh, oppressed in the center. It is an awesome act that those 40 bishops uh, took at the end of the Council. And also, it's a revolutionary uh, commitment that they, they made. And also, uh, when we look at the church, a life-giving commitment for the life of the church. Because the more the church is close to the poor, the more the church gives life. The importance of the Pact of Catacomb is to return to being a church for the poor, a poor servant church. I think the importance of that is to place the poor at the centers of our apostolate ministry in the church. If the church is going to make an effort to live according to the evangelical principles that Jesus has passed on to us. Such a church will be persecuted and rejected. To symbolize this, they went to the catacombs where the Christians of the first, second and third centuries had their Eucharists and their meetings underground. They were a persecuted church. So the Pact of the Catacombs took into consideration we must be ready to not only face criticism but also face uh, persecution and in many cases martyrdom. It was a reflection on the Gospel in the light of a process that had been Vatican II. Each of the statements that are in the pact has scripture references alongside them. So I suppose it was a way in which they would enact a gospel way of life from the standpoint of making an option for the poor. I think it was a creative document and it was also a very demanding way of life that they set out at that moment in time. Another 500 bishops in the council put their signatures to this document. Elder Camera in Brazil, Mendes Arceo in Mexico, uh, Leonidas Proaño in Ecuador. They started preparing for what is known as the Council of Medellin, which was 
an attempt to bring the pact of the catacombs down to a Latin American uh, reality. In Latin America, you didn't have a church that was at the service of the people, it was more at the service of the wealthy and the governing classes. So there was a need for a, a complete change. However, the main tension arises because the fathers teach the gospel as a gospel of liberation, a gospel which emphasizes the words of Jesus when he unrolled the scroll of the Bible before a hushed audience in the synagogue and first announced his mission. The Lord has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to set the downtrodden free. That is subversive talk in Latin America. The bishops and priests that followed that line um, took seriously what it meant to be on the side of the poor. They began to work with the local people in what they call Comunidades de Base, faith-based Christian communities, where people were oppressed by structures, whether it was to do with governments, military, uh, land reform. The church began to be in solidarity with them. It cost people their lives because they challenged systematic injustices. People like Irene McCormick in Peru, Jean Donovan, a lay woman in El Salvador. Thousands and thousands of catechists end up paying that price. Today, the Church Universal honors a son of Central America. Yesterday in San Salvador, mass was celebrated to mark the beatification of Oscar Romero, Archbishop of San Salvador. The military dictatorship of El Salvador viewed as a threat to the state those priests, religious sisters, and lay pastoral leaders who were seeking to empower the poor by encouraging them to view their social and economic situation through the lens of the gospel. Romero was shocked by the brutal killing of his friend and Jesuit priest, Rutilio Grande. Along with two other fellow workers, Father Grande was gunned down by forces sympathetic to the landowners. Romero realized that there is a point where silence becomes complicity with evil and corruption. And where the call to speak out prophetically on behalf of the powerless becomes compelling. But if he criticized the actions of the military in crushing legitimate opposition, Romero also condemned those who sought to oppose violence with violence. In a sermon in 1977, he said, we have never preached violence except the violence of love, which left Christ nailed to a cross. Archbishop Romero has never been forgotten by the people of El Salvador. He represents the solidarity of the Church of Jesus Christ with them in their darkest hour. Oscar Romero was always my icon. I always looked up to him. I remember hearing about his death and I remember reading about his legacy. Number one that I think he reminds me is that courage is not the absence of fear. It's the willingness to walk through fear in the pursuit of a higher cause. Oscar Romero knew when he spoke out, he was putting his life at risk. During his three years as Archbishop of El Salvador, over 100,000 innocent people were murdered. The other thing he taught us is that don't aspire to things beyond the horizon. Don't even look for God solely beyond the horizon, beyond the here and now. For him, people who were poor and persecuted, they were the face of God in the world. Those that had nothing. We're seeing images of refugees from Syria and from all over the world. Yes, our heart breaks, pleads for them. But what Romero teaches us and what many other people teach us is that in the spirit of the downtrodden, in those who are beaten right down, that they're stripped of everything in life, that's the face of God laid bare in the world. That's the suffering Christ on the cross made real now. Today has been the opening of the Romero Institute of Peace and Justice, keeping the legacy of Oscar Romero alive. We feel very strongly, as he did, that the church comes alive in its people, where there's justice, where there's the promotion of communities of people who live 
live in accordance with Christian values of love, of compassion, of solidarity. There is Jesus in the midst of us. And it's people on the margins that give hope to the church. My memory of Oscar Romero was as a parish priest in San Miguel in the department of Morazan in El Salvador. Fairly standard, ordinary, nothing different about Oscar Romero. But that all changed when a friend of his, Father Rutillo Grand, uh, was murdered. It was then the gospel spoke to him and that really at the age of, I think it was about 55, he himself would say he had a conversion, a conversion to the poor. Uh, to justice, to the liberation of the poor. Now, I don't live in Latin America at the moment. I live in Australia. So what does the option for the poor mean to us? And have we learned anything from liberation theology, from the option from the poor, from Paulo Freire, from Oscar Romero, from Don Helda Camara in Brazil? Have we transferred any of that, and can we? It's no coincidence that the Pope pulls no punches when he's talking about the West, particularly in, in the financial world, and, and I suppose trying to chastise us in a sense in Europe for uh, the way we obscured the simplicity and the radicalness of that message of the kingdom of God being at hand, uh, which is a kingdom of love and sharing and peace in this world. The authenticity, the simplicity of early Christianity has been lost through layers of unnecessary regimentation and regularization within the church. The message of Christ is, his kingdom is not of this world. What he means by that is that it's not the way this world lives now. What we're doing is a sense is getting back to an appreciation of this world as Laudato Si Senor, the, the Pope's latest encyclical, appreciation of that beauty of creation in all its entirety. And that means justice for humankind, respect for animals, respect for environment. This is, this is a precious, it, it's the mystical body of Christ this world that we've been blessed to have charge over. The trajectory of Pope Francis is a great witness to the content and the commitment of the Pact of the Catacombs. He wants the church to be with the poor, and for the poor, and in so far as possible, as the poor. The pact asked bishops to leave their palaces, to leave their big houses, and to go and live amongst the ordinary people, as many of them did. Although it was the intention of the signatories not to have their names revealed, with the passing of time, the names were revealed. And it is interesting to notice that there's no bishop from Ireland, no bishop from England, or from the States, there's uh, nobody either, just one from Canada. There was very little response in that sense. For me, you know, when we commemorated 50 years of the Vatican Council, it was a moment to really take stock, if you like, to do an examine of conscience yet again about where have we lived this out and where have we not lived this out. That calling forth to that faithfulness that was present 50 years ago in this document is equally valid today. I think it would be a very creative thing if the global church and the bishops were to relook at it and see how they would issue a pact today given the light of the gospel, given the reality of our world today, what they might say. It's just the thing that Vatican II closed with the bishops of the world and the cardinals and the pope deciding, we have got to get back to the simplicity of the message 
of Christ when it was a radical message which they lived in the simplicity and I suppose in the challenge of living as an underground movement in the catacombs. So the pact of the catacombs which was part of that Gaudium et Spes, the joy and hope of Vatican II, it's a rediscovery, pain stripping of all those layers, unnecessary layers of kind of worldly legislation which would have people conform to man-made rules. There's only one rule, the rule of love, uh, the God-given rule of love. The social message of the gospel, it talks about the person. It doesn't talk about body and soul. You don't distinguish and you don't justify injustice, social injustice in this world. You don't justify it by saying, blessed are the poor, you're going to be all right in the next life. It's not about that. The kingdom of God is, is at hand, is now. That's certainly something that, that this new breed of priests coming out can certainly bring is a, a centrality of Christ in their lives, you know. People would say, you know, the church is outdated, the Bible's outdated, you know, it doesn't fit into our modern world. But uh, the fact of the matter is that God is unchanging, you know, God is always the same, God is always love. The Gospels are full of, you know, great examples of how to live a holy, moral, good life. Christ was out there helping the poor, you know, and uh, I think it's a great example for us today that we can, we can still do that ourselves, we can concretely help people. I remember I was walking around Dublin one evening and uh, there was these young people, you know, teenagers, and uh, walking around with like, you know, flasks and sandwiches and, and they were giving them out to the homeless. And I just out of interest went to them and, and said, you know, what group are you with? And they said St. Vincent de Paul, you know, and it's great to see, you know, that the gospel values in young people, you know, and, and young people very much willing to help out and uh, with those in need. Nobody should walk our streets in Dublin or anywhere hungry. We are Capuchins, followers of St. Francis, and our main concern is for the dignity, the respect of the people who are coming to the centre. We put our trust entirely in God, and it is through the Holy Spirit that we are surviving because we get 450,000 from the government and our running costs are 2.2 million. So without the generosity and the help of the people of Ireland under no circumstances would we be in a position to keep our lifeline in operation. And I have no doubt about it that it is through the Holy Spirit that all that is coming to us. Why should people in the margin line be ignored? Every person is to be treated with the greatest of kindness and the greatest of love. And we treat the people coming for meals as if Christ himself was coming for a meal. It is faith that can change our lives, that can make us better people. It can help us to go through difficult times in life. And it will make us different and it will make our world different. It will make all the difference. At the same time, it seems that we have forgotten about the spirit of the Second Vatican Council and where we have forgotten the spirit of the Catacomb Pact. Nothing has really changed in humankind. Looking at our world today, looking at our wars, the ongoing conflicts, at the situation of those at the margins, we still have to learn to speak up for truth. Being a missionary today, to a big extent, means to speak up for truth and justice. We continuously ask the question, why are the poor poor? It is not only our relief operations, but it is important to have the courage to stand up for those at the margins and to ask the most crucial question, why are the poor poor? The fact is a challenge, and it will remain a challenge for generations to come. It is important not to forget this pact. I think what the pact of the catacombs does is it led that way for people who were missioned to go with the mission of the reign of God. It gives that moral authority. It asks that we just do the simple things of really listening to who are on the margins, how to really live a simple way of life, not to get caught into the 
consumeristic ways of our world, not to be cloaked in gold and silver, not to put ourselves on a status pedestal, but to really use our spaces and places to really represent those that are really struggling and suffering. Living it out is the challenge. The words mean nothing unless they are embodied. It's up to each one of us to make a difference. We can dictate and we can philosophise and we can criticise, but it, we, each of us within our heart have the ability to make a difference. You know, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? When I was sick, did you tend to my sick body? So it's about being with the vulnerable, isn't it? Whoever and wherever the vulnerable are, and just being love to them. Armed and violent struggle appears to some people to bring a more immediate solution. But the church knows that love is the only force that transforms. Bringing love to the vulnerable, to the marginalized, that may be very difficult. And, and going the long distance with that love, sometimes at a cost. But the cost, it's worth it. You know, it's, it's, I think it's worth it. I think it's, I think it's probably, in the end, the only way. Packed at the catacombs from Vatican II, to me, they remind us that the future is communities that reach out and carry the burdens of those who are weakest, most vulnerable, most persecuted in society. That's what Jesus did. And the Pact of the Catacombs reminds us that our challenge is to do now in history what Jesus did during his lifetime. The Pact of the Catacombs comes alive in our embodiment of solidarity for those who are on the margins. And it's that dialogue between reflection and action that lies at the core of our faith. When Jesus was pushed, when he was asked, are you saying the commandments don't matter? He said, I'm not. What is important is love of God and love of neighbor. And for me, what Jesus teaches us and what the Pact of the Catacombs and Vatican II reminds us is that these two are inseparable. You cannot love God without loving your neighbor. And that's it's the simple truth at the heart of our Christian faith.